as soon as the AI starts to develop their own languages between each other, we need to unplug them. Because that's the point where we lose the ability and sight of what are they thinking and seeing and doing and how are they actually operating. So in retrospect, the only way to know what an, why, how an AI gave an answer is to, in the term people use, kill it. You have to like literally stop it, which it kills it, to go investigate how it actually derived the answer it got. Hello and welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Timmy Napso here, Executive Vice President and Co-Founder of Fortis. And I also have with me my friend, Kevin Shamoon, who uh, is no stranger to this podcast. We've been on before. We were actually talking about AI a few months back. And since that time, Kevin, we had outlined that you are part of the ETA, Electronic Transaction Association, AI Committee. Um, and I wanted to first and foremost ask you, how did you join the AI committee and why did you join the AI committee? Why is that important to you? Um, and I know you've been part of ETA for quite some time. You were on stage there in Las Vegas talking through that. And we'll, we'll get through some of that here uh, during our conversation. Uh, but welcome, Kevin. And if we could kickstart the conversation with a little bit of why AI. Yeah, thanks, Timmy. I appreciate you having me back as well. Um, yeah, I'm the co-chair of the AI committee for the Electronic Transaction Association. Uh, I've been volunteering with ETA for quite some time. Uh, I was the chair of the technology committee for about four or five years as well. Um, you know, always enthralled with sort of the latest and greatest in what's happening from a technology standpoint. So I'd say that's probably my passion in that regard. So, you know, kind of following the, the bleeding edge. So back when it was, you know, a little bit around crypto and that, uh, excitement is sort of faded, but it's still there. Uh, but with AI, I mean, it's just, I always try to give back. So any way that I can give back, doing this podcast is a great way as well. You know, with the ETA and the committee, a lot of the goal is to be able to publish and give back and articles and, you know, being on stage for, you know, various events. And, you know, another aspect of ETA is also political. You know, they do a lot of lobbying in Washington for what's happening in uh, not just the payment industry, but how AI is going to impact the payment industry as well. So some white papers come out, help publish those, review them, provide comments back, you know, a lot of that stuff as well. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I mean, obviously, you know, having a highly technical background, a developer um, is is certainly helpful in that case because nobody was asking me to be on the AI committee, Kevin. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> The only AI I was familiar with was Alan Iverson. Practice? We're talking about practice? Practice? <laughs> One of those things. Um, but yeah, no, that's awesome. I know that when we were at ETA in Las Vegas, you know, a lot of this conversation, the follow up to that, but a lot has changed, obviously, since that time as well. We'll dig into that a little bit, but really uh, a hot topic at ETA. As a matter of fact, just correct me if I'm wrong here, but you know, it's center, it was like literally that one stage in, in kind of the middle of all of ETA. And if I'm not mistaken, it was the busiest speaking uh, uh, panel that we had around AI. It was, you know, the feedback I got from, you know, the people that kind of run ETA as well was it was the highest attended uh, session, uh, standing room only, which is exciting. And even oh. after, you know, seeing people walking around, I got a lot of, you know, thanks for the information. It was great. So, you know, it's it's always good to kind of just get validation from the standpoint of the things that you're providing out there. And it's giving other people value as well. I mean, that's the, like, again, that's the goal of giving back. It's not just about uh, competition. It's about helping others in our industry to make the industry go forward as a whole. I mean, that's that's part of what I always try to do as well. You know, there's a lot of competitive things that you can do. And, it's about execution of the day that matters most. So you know, however yep. people want to go through and take the the feedback and the, the things that they hear when I'm on a panel, uh, I'm always willing to help. Yeah, awesome. And what would you say was kind of the theme of that panel that you know came out of what you shared with the group or, and, and the other panelists as well that would be real um, uh, valuable for the audience to hear about? 
I think the biggest thing that came out of the panel is going to be really around like where AI is going. Not just, you know, there's a lot of curiosity of what's happening in the payment industry. We talked quite a bit about that on the panel. But I think it's just more in general of like what's AI doing because it's this, you know, quote unquote new thing, even though if you, you know, really think about the progression of AI over time uh, and where we come from. Uh, the reality of kind of the panel discussion, though, as a whole, uh, in my opinion, it really centers around what's happening within the acquiring space, the payment space, and how we can use generative AI specifically, because, you know, the whole progression of AI that, you know, maybe we can get into a little bit as well. But uh, I would say that was probably the biggest thing is just how is it, how, what is it happening in the progression of AI? Yeah. Um, and again, you know, that is moving really quickly. Um, we've seen a lot of different things. A couple examples that I have experienced since even the event in Las Vegas. I've witnessed how artificial intelligence is really affecting the marketing uh, uh, department here at our company, how we're able to do things a uh, little bit of a, a quicker manner, um, how smart the AI actually is. I would say it still isn't unchecked. Uh, the, the human element tied with the AI uh, certainly is where the value is today. But you're seeing kind of the future imprint of what this might actually look like as we continue to move into the future. I'm not saying the future. I'm not saying years away. Months is what it feels like. I also witnessed various systems on the phone call side of things that are escalating based on tone of voice to a manager if somebody feels upset, yep. rating that that call, um, matching it up uh, against that agent to find out if certain uh, representatives are getting more, you know, angry customers, if you will. I've seen some of that action in place. And then online, I'm seeing a lot of activity there. And there's a lot of confusion there. You mentioned machine learning. <laughs> How does one actually separate what is always, you know, some something knowing what your preferences are and, and how you like it and so on and so forth? I feel like that's existed for quite some time. And yet, it's coming out as this new AI term. Is a lot of this actually artificial intelligence of the future? Or is it just what it always was? And we're just rebundling it and using the terms <laughs> artificial intelligence because of the buzzword that's out there. I would say it's a little bit of both. You know, people have classified, uh, they, they coined the term artificial intelligence when generative started to come out more. So AI in the past have really been using the movies, let's be real, right? You look at iRobot and stuff like that, but it's always been, you know, you go back to the beginning of coding, it was very literal if-then statements, and there was a lot of them. And then it turned into how can we train a computer to build its own, uh, to recognize sequences and patterns, that's called machine learning. So machine learning has now kind of gotten one step further, and they're different, right? Machine learning is different than generative AI, the way that the models work and everything else, but you know, we're in the realm of generative AI, and the difference there is, Somebody didn't give it the information from a baseline standpoint and ask it a question. It gives you the answer. Like it's learning a quote unquote, if you will, with the large language models, what, like what's out there. Uh, and it can respond to almost every, any question you can. Um, you have chat GPT 4.0, you have Claude just released uh, a new version as well. And they're all gunning for smarter, faster, cheaper. The cost of AI, I mean, look at NVIDIA stock has gone crazy because of, you know, they're powering a lot of the AI that's out there today. So if you can get AI to be faster, cheaper, you know, it's going to be a huge win for all of us, really. I mean, just using Microsoft Teams, if you're a Teams company or Google, they have there as well. You know, all of them are embedding generative AI into their application. So when you're in a meeting, it'll give you'll take notes, transcribe in real time. It'll give you a to-do list out of the meeting. It'll send a follow-up email. It'll add tasks to the task board. Like all this stuff that somebody had to do manually is now being done generatively using, you know, really a computer. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting too, because when you start to think about what is possible, you people always start with some of the more simple tasks, like somebody sitting there being an assistant, a virtual assistant, as an example, yeah. for 
probably the last two decades, the concept of virtual assistant offshore, get my calendar scheduled, get all my tasks together, reply to basic emails, escalate some other ones, feels very much like that is probably the first place that we're going to start to see some of the largest shifts come in. And we're already seeing it, obviously. We're seeing organizations out there that have taken kind of level one support and implemented in AI. We've seen um, you know, AI agents that are now communicating via email are able to respond fairly uh, 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 you know, coherently. I mean, it feels human uh, is, is the idea. I've listened to some uh, voice and I don't think it's quite there yet. I think that the dialect and the idea that Having understood, you know, understanding that nobody speaks that perfectly is kind of the part that they're going to have to, you know, solve a little bit of. But I also believe that the general public is going to understand what the value of this is that instead of nobody answering the phone, somebody answers and gives you something that you need versus, you know, the day of leaving a voicemail. Does that go away altogether? The day of, you know, uh, um, having to be in a situation where you don't get the answer immediately. You know, quicker, sure, and cheaper, right? Is going to be something that is hyper important as we continue to move into the future. So the question I have here is: with everything good, you know, with light comes this idea of somebody <laughs> that is going to try to really bring some darkness to the industry. There are always those characters that are, you know, the cyber attackers, if you will, that are just you know, licking their chops and trying to utilize this technology in a negative uh, uh, light. We talk about this, um, you know, Star Wars type, <laughs> you know, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader <laughs> going on here. Um, I know there was some of that at the conference, actually. And if you could kind of highlight the talk track coming out of ETA and what we're seeing, that'd be great. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the biggest risk is fraud at the end of the day. Um, and so what are the bad actors doing? You know, just like we have our, you know, chat GPT, Claude, you know, whatever, from that standpoint, the bad guys have theirs as well. Um, and it's, it's almost like a similar subscription model for some of those, uh, bad actors as well. I mean, these guys are writing viruses now that can change their, uh, signatures, which is how like bad applications are identified that can change your signatures dynamically. So as they're affecting machines, how they look and feel is evolving to make it harder for us, you know, on the, the I'll call it the good side, to protect our computers against some of this stuff. And if they get inside the network, I mean, that's, uh, that's where a lot of the problems cause. Uh, you think about all of the, you know, the different attacks that happen and all the scams and you know everything else that happens from that standpoint, they're they're getting way better at impersonating people. Um, you know, if you don't have a as funny as it sounds, if you don't have a secret code word that nobody knows except for you and your loved ones, you should get one. Because just listening to this podcast right now, somebody can go upload the podcast and say, "Hey, I want to talk like Kevin. Be like Kevin." All my inflection points, how I speak, you know, perfectly will sound like me. And they yep. should call you to me and say, hey, I kidnapped Kevin. Give me a ransom. And how do I know it's really Kevin? I mean, it's, right. it's, it's like, you know, you start to go like the paranoia extreme and it starts to get, you know, really, I'll say really deep, really fast of what's going to be uh, able to be done out there. There are sites right now that I can upload this video, by the way, and say, hey, Tim and I are going to speak Portuguese. I don't know a word of Portuguese. And it would translate our podcast right now into Portuguese and Italian. And I mean, name your, I forget, they have a, a bazillion languages you can choose from. And it'll speak like us. It'll sound like us. It'll have our tone of voice and, you know, a, a lot of different languages. So that's not like, that's just the start of it. And then you start to talk about, you want to go really up more into the realm of the, the bad actors is, uh, they call them deep fake videos. They're really not deep fakes anymore because... They're so easy to create nowadays. You know, you can tell a lot of the different AI models to, you can give it a story and it will create a movie for you. So I saw one and this is going back a few months and it was like the, you know, the introduction of it where somebody said, Hey, I want to show me a, a video, create a video of a woman walking down the street in a downtown setting 
wearing a red dress and a purse on her shoulder with people walking by glaring at her. And, you know, sure enough, 30 second video is generated and it's exactly what was described. So, yeah. you know, that's going to be a big thing coming up soon is like, we're going to be replaced to me. It's going to be, you know, somebody writing a script or not even writing a script. Say, hey, go generate a podcast with Kevin and Timmy's likeness. And then we're going to watch it and go, man, that's a pretty good podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're watching people kind of go through this thing of comparing it and you're already seeing versions of this happen yeah. where they're like, they nailed these things. These things are still off and they're working very quickly to fix those things. Yeah and continue to iterate and it is a learning and it's like well you learn this wrong try it again and then people are like wow that's you know how many times is it going to take it to learn well the idea is is probably faster than a human being now <laughs> like that is what the part is because a human being isn't getting it the first time well for most the one thing about generative AI that people fail to realize is us as, as humans go through our life experiences that have our knowledge based on what we've learned yeah an AI model is trained on data and facts. So I don't know much about, you know, subject A, but the AI model knows about every subject. So when it starts to connect the dots faster than us, which is why it does such a great job at what it does, is because, you know, I would have to go into, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but if I was to go talk about a procedure, the AI, the AI models already know about the procedure, but they also know about some of the biomechanical of how like the human body works more so than like that their ability to connect the dots is really where the the true um, uh, amazement, at least from my perspective, comes in with what's happening in generative AI. Yeah. 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 It's really interesting as well. And I know this wasn't part of the panel, but it's kind of like this idea of what are the children of today, our children? What is it that they should be learning in the future? You know, while some people say development, others say don't because it's going to be so, you know, that's going to be all taken care of. I've heard some philosophies and theories of like, really, we want to go back in time and we got to start using our, our hands again. That the difference between AI and a human being is possibly an electrician, a plumber, uh, a builder, uh, you know, car carpenter, you know, those types of things uh, start to, to possibly make a difference because we may be a lot further away from actual AI robots, you know, Will Smith movie style coming to, to, to life. Sure. Although I've seen versions of that as well. Then we are person writing a paper yeah. or, you know, I went on understanding the full force of really it's the, you know, your ability to handle a prompting, right? Like, like, it's good based on how you prompt it. Similar, I said, I want to draw a picture, create artwork of a sunset on the beach in Mexico. Okay. And literally, it, thing just created a really beautiful image where I was like, oh, wow, like I can actually get this printed now and on a canvas and, and hang it up. Because although I've been looking for all this unique art, this just created something that was good enough to hang in my office. So really interesting. But what are your thoughts on that? Like what... Should the youth begin? Because we're talking about the future and the, the ETA understands how this is going to work as it relates to payments and industry and stuff like that. But we are all really a connected commerce experience. And this next generation takes that to another level uh, and continues to evolve it. So where do you see that? You know, just a fun future looking into the crystal ball. Kevin, what do you think? Um, I would say what not to do is the development stuff is solved. Like, I mean, quite literally, um, you can have it. Now, you still need somebody today to go take the code, review it, and bet it. But I would yeah. say we're not that far off from, I used to watch you know, some of the Star Trek stuff when I was younger. And you know, they would just say, hey, give me a program to do this. And it would say, oh, it's already done. Like, it just comes up. Is that, is that, is that, is that, is that it? There? <laughs> Not everybody could do that, by the way, Kevin. There Not everybody could do that. That's our trick move. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I mean, so like from a development standpoint, I mean, I think that's, that's a lot of, uh, I'll say that, that box is checked. Um, there's some people believe that like as a, as a human race, that will go down to three and four day work weeks because of generative AI, quite literally. Like the need to work is going to become a lot less. 
Now, the reality of it is it goes back to like one of my favorite movies is iRobot. I, I bring this up. I think I brought up the last, the last podcast. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, are we, you know, what yeah. are we doing and setting the human fate up for in that regard? Because just as much as we have good actors and bad actors, if AI goes unchecked, and I think it was, uh, it goes, I, maybe Elon Musk, I may be misquoting if it was him or Bill Gates, but one of the messages they said is, as soon as the AI starts to develop their own languages between each other, we need to unplug them. Because that's the point where we lose the ability and sight of what are they thinking and seeing and doing and how are they actually operating. So in retrospect, the only way to know what an, why, how an AI gave an answer is to, in the term people use, is kill it. You have to like literally stop it, which it kills it, to go investigate how it actually derived the answer it got. So, but yeah. once it gives the answer and you don't, you only have so much time, but once you get past that time point, then it's just like, I can't tell you how I thought of something. It's the same yeah. thing of how the AIs that are being built today can't tell you how they came up with something either. Exactly well, right. You know, that's, that's the thing. I mean, one of the early, probably five, six, eh, maybe even a little longer, I was at a conference and one of the guys on stage talking about the future of AI, this is probably 20... Uh, probably almost 10 years ago. And the analogy he used, and I don't know if I told you this on the last podcast, but I love the analogy because it's like, imagine a, step, uh, a set of stairs and a chimpanzee is standing on a, the one step. We're standing on the next step above it. And we're trying to describe to the, pinchant, the chimpanzee how we put a plane in the air. And he doesn't understand. Well, AI is going to be like five steps up the realm. And it's going to be doing things and we're going to go, how does it, like, how did you do it? And we're not going to be able to comprehend how it came up with those things. And it goes back to the whole thing of it knows everything at once from every industry, from every specialization. So you start to take engineering with biochemistry, with, you know, all these different things. And you combine them into one brain, which is essentially what's happening. Yeah. And it can start to create some really amazing things. So I would, right. say, I would say that's my yeah. excitement for the future is what is it going to do for the quality of human life? And the other side of it is like, you know, should we be scared of it? Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's always yeah. fear of change and the unknown. Absolutely. There is also this idea that, hey, look, if you're talking about something moving so quickly, then what path should we be taking today on this, the next five, 10 years to remain relevant, whether you are a small business, a mid-sized business. And I did ask this question several months ago as well when we chatted on this. And, you know, I don't know that the answer has technically changed, right? But what, you know, would you say after four or five months uh, uh, and the ETA and what we've learned um, that we should be doing today if we know what's coming? I mean, from a, I'll say local standpoint, I think it's going to be around service. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I like to go out and hang out with my friends and, you know, do different things. And it's going to be about how can you create good experiences, regardless of where you are. If you're a business that sells a product, when somebody walks in the store, what's the experience like? By the way, can you use some of this generative AI to know that Kevin walked in the store and then prompt a message on a screen because it knows it's Kevin. This is kind of freaky, but knows it's Kevin and say, hey, Kevin, welcome back. You know, I would recommend this product to you last time you bought something similar. You know, those, yes. are, the, those are the things that you start to take the experiences and really leverage technology where local can start to, I'll say, you know, fight the bigger guys uh, if you're a small business owner. Um, and on the other side of it, there's people that are building point of sale systems, for example, to do just that for you, to help you yep. scale and grow. Because as an individual business and you're a small business, like your core competency isn't the technology that's running your store. Your core competency is selling the products in your store and catering to your customers. So Absolutely. stay focused on that and go leverage somebody else's and you know, pay the fee for the, uh, the software that you're being provided. And I think you'd be surprised by what some of the ROI would be on something like that. Um, I said, that's what's really coming up first and foremost. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, so, you know, bad characters, we talked a little bit about them. Um, so like you mentioned a few things of protecting ourselves with, you know, loved ones with a code word and things like that. Where do you think the most damage is done with what's happening with AI or the largest fear? Is it, and I'm talking about current fear, not when in the future of humanity, we got to unplug it. Is it your perspective on short term? What is going to be the largest issue? And we know that through any emerging market, if you will, there are huge opportunities for particular players. And then there's also huge failures that can come of, come of that. Um, I would say from a short term standpoint, you know, the, the biggest thing to look out for is how can we better our lives by utilizing the technology? You know, I would really suggest everyone download the apps on their phones, the official ones. Don't go download the ones you're paying for. They're all free. Just for a side note, because yep. I've had people say, oh, I paid $50 for this app. It's awesome. I'm like, all right, well, um, but go download them and, and ask your questions there. I think it's going to change how search engines are used. You know, uh, I saw a stat when ChatGPT was first released publicly, the number of Google searches dropped dramatically. I think that's going to continue. Um, people are going to more social media sites and searching in the social media site for answers for things like, hey, I want to go out to dinner. Where should I go? You know, even those things, I think are going to start to be um, quality of life things. Like, hey, make me a reservation. Like, I think it's coming. Plan my trip as well. Plan my oh, trip. Yeah. Plan, and, um, the Microsoft Copilot has that right now. If you log yep. into it on the right, there's a bunch of options. Plan my trip is one of them. And it'll get set your whole yep. itinerary. I mean, those are the things that I think um, are really going to be that they're now. So when you say short term, like, you can really do it right now. My, you know, I'm talking about taking a trip to Europe next summer. And I'm going to go, I mean, I actually had it plugged it in, believe it or not, as I use different, I don't use Copilot that often, I use some of the other ones. Um, but I'm going to have to go try that out and see how it looks. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Out of everything you've seen, everything coming out of the ETA, what would you say you're most excited about in our space in particular, in the payment financial technology world? Um, I would say the biggest thing for me is going to be around, you know, what can generative AI do for um, the shopping experience, right? And I know that's sort of related to our space, but from actually accepting payments, there's not a lot that's happening with generative AI and accepting payments. It's everything around shopping and payment experience. I think that's really going to be uh, a huge change. The back office systems aren't changing much. Customer service, as you mentioned earlier, that's going to be a huge drastic improvement uh, from a immediate response resolution standpoint. You know, those are things that are being done. Uh, but as far as like, what do I think is the most exciting to me, like in the very near term, it's going to be, how is it going to change my shopping experience and suggestions? And if it gets to know your personality, because we are human, we all are very similar, whether we'd like to believe it or not. Yeah. Um, and we have the same patterns and tendencies. If you go take that personality test, I mean, that goes to show you that people have already created before AI and before all this stuff happened, you had people that were studying humans and they already categorized, you know, different psyches. But I think that's really what's going to start to come out of, um, some yeah. of the AI stuff. What's interesting about that is, uh, last year I went to the master's. And um, I got there and, and the buddy I was with, I actually lost him in the crowd Was everybody actually just dressed exactly the same, <laughs> which, you know, you kind of see that at a golf tournament, There's a lot of funny things going on with that, but you're absolutely right. The kind of idea that it's mu that the, the nuances, you kind of the Pareto loss concept of we're fairly, we're 80% all there is that little 20% that separates one from the other that in total agreement that that is what AI is going to capture and probably teach us some things that somebody that profiled 80% similar to you also liked all of these other things that we think you're going to like. And it's, it's an interesting uh, world that we're going to be in. You know, I think the idea that unplugging something is after it's really powerful, that concept becomes something that is like, not impossible, but a near impossibility. You know, there are people that believe we need to unplug social media yeah. at this point. Like it is, you know, unchecked, if you will, to a certain extent. Data is being, you know, transferred. Privacy and listening in on devices and who's listening in and how it's being used. You know, 
we do talk, talk about cyber attacks, but there's also this other kind of idea of protection of, uh, you know, state, right? And what that looks like as you look at like a broader global issue that, you know, uh, if you watch Marvel and the fun Marvel movies, it's like, look, you know, the weapons that they're talking about, they're, they're other worlds that are using much larger weapons. So we have to keep up with it because you can't stop them. And I think that's that's a lot of the fear as well. We know that, you know, data ransom situations that have happened over the last, you know, several years. We know of the scam of, you know, can you please wire me money? We're now all banking actually changed. Do you know if you want to just do a normal wire, then why are they asking all these questions? And why because so many people got burned yeah. from these experiences that I hope that one of the emerging uh, AI models is kind of that Jedi concept that that you know green lightsaber is out there helping to fight against this. So I, when one is coming up, so does the other to kind of battle battle against it. Um, we see in our industry as an example chargebacks being a big thing, mitigating chargebacks. Who's a card holder? Do you believe a lot of these things get solved through AI that they become less about numerical information that you have this card number that's connected to a person that's connected to their social security number? Is there a different version of that that we see over the next five to 10 years? Uh, I think absolutely. I mean, Visa's already announced that their payment forum, which I attended, they're a certain use pass key technology or it's coming out. And essentially what that is, is the way you shop online is going to change. Um, in the way that they said their car, the, the card is not going away, right? They love their card. The card is going to be used for things differently than I think you and I realize as just consumers. Because if you yeah. start talking about security, it's you know something you know, something you have, um, and something you are. So biometrics, you know, something like in a token, the card is going to become your physical token. And their Visa announced new ways that they're going to be able to add your card to your digital wallet, which is going to be tap the card to the phone instead of key it in or take a picture of it. So that's what's coming. So then yeah. they, your card is going to become your credential into your bank. Got and it. The fact that you have passkey, which to set up a passkey on your device is it's not complex, but it's got a few steps along the way to make sure that it's Kevin. Uh, yeah. So, like, that's where the protection is coming from. It's going to be around some of the new standards out there for security, the FIDO standard, which is what ASCII is based on. Uh, you have, like, I don't type my password for some sites anymore at all. Like, I just I go to click the login screen and ask me for my email address. And then the, the prompt on my phone pops up because I have their app on my phone. And it says, yes, I'm logging in. Like, Chase does that now. Uh, I think yep. eBay, PayPal, like a lot of these companies are going to that level of authentication. So that's a lot harder to go steal. Uh, it's not, you know, if you're listening to this and somebody ever calls you and asks you for those codes or says click yes, like absolutely never do that. Uh, it, it, all the prompts say you should never do that too, but people just click it and don't read. Or the person on the other side of the phone is very persuasive. And who knows, maybe it's a generative AI bot on the other side of the phone that's actually talking yep. to you because uh, that's translations. Another thing that's you know become somewhat instant. I've seen a lot of videos where uh, one of the companies, I forgot the name of the clip that they sell, it sits on your lapel practically and you could be in another country. If it hears the other foreign language, it'll translate for you. You speak and then it'll translate it back to the other person and you're having a full-on conversation with somebody that was never possible before. So, I mean, it's, it's Google, a cool Google, It's like Google Translate 5.0, yeah, right? It's like not having to type it. And yeah, no, it's just it's happening it's, in real time. It's, it's, real, it's quiet until it knows it needs to prompt. Exactly right. And you're not even yeah. asking it to. It's just doing it because it knows that's what it should do. Like, that's where the generative AI stuff is really coming up. It's cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. Very cool stuff. Part of it's exciting. Part of it is definitely scary. I don't know how to feel about some of this stuff, right? It's uh, there's a, there's a there are a lot of characters out there that are really concerned. But I think that as long as the, the good folks are fighting the good fight, you know, we will uh, certainly see the positives that come from this. Uh, Kevin, anything else you uh, would like to share around AI or any other thoughts? Um, I mean, learn how to prompt. I mean, that's that's the the, the trailing message here is you learn how powerful different prompting can be 
and how it impacts yep. the response you get by prompting properly. So, um, you know, just go and do some tutorials on how to prompt properly. You'll be amazed at what the difference is in the responses that you get. So awesome. Kevin, as usual, thank you. Nice to see you today. And thanks for listening. Well, let's talk about the three key takeaways from this podcast. Number one, the double-edged sword of AI. We know that AI holds tremendous potential to improve our lives by improving our shopping experiences, groundbreaking scientific discoveries, scheduling our trips, and really the possibilities become endless. But there's also a flip side and we just need to be mindful of the potential risks to our own personal and our business and ensure that AI is being used ethically when we are employing it. Number two, AI as a tool for small businesses. It's important that you're not intimidated by AI. It is here, it's going to be staying around. And these powerful tools that are emerging are helping small businesses compete. So AI can personalize these customer experiences. It can recommend products automatically and also streamline your backend oper operations. And, and this frees up your time to focus on what matters most, and that should be your customers. Number three, the future of payments with AI. Now, AI is revolutionizing the way that we pay. As Kevin mentioned, just you can imagine walking into a store, having your face or your phone instantly recognized at checkout. AI can personalize the payment experience. It can recommend things. There's so much potential there. But what ultimately can happen and how we should be utilizing it is making it faster and more convenient for customers. Additionally, AI can analyze these transactions in real time to be able to detect fraud and protect businesses and customers alike alike. So it's just the beginning of AI and how it is going to transform the world of payments. Well, that's the episode of Embedded. If you have found value in this episode, please, we ask that you leave us a five-star rating and subscribe to stay up to date on payments, software, and emerging technologies.